a little bit of an introduction. Um, we're very uh, thrilled to have Christy Trenier here with us to moderate um, our, our panel on new modes of publishing and distribution. Uh, Christy is an independent curator, art director, and arts consultant. Her previous roles include Director of Visual, Digital, and Media Arts at Mount Center for Arts and Creativity, Curator at the Art Gallery of Alberta, in which she curated Future Station 2015 Alberta Biennial of Contemporary Art, as well as exhibitions at the Art Gallery of Alberta and Enterprise Square Galleries. Uh, she was also Public Art Director at the Edmonton Arts Council, where she managed the City of Edmonton's public art collections, related exhibitions and public art programs, and grant writer at Banff Centre. Trinier holds a bachelor's degree in visual art and English from the University of Victoria, and a master's degree in public art from the Dutch Institute as a Huyens scholar in the Netherlands. She is currently pursuing PhD studies in philosophy, art, and critical thought at European Graduate School based in Switzerland. She is a secretary of Ochishiwan Contemporary Art Collective and producer of public art, publication studio Edmonton at 66B, a print-on-demand artist book publishing project. Please welcome Christy. Thank you for the great introduction and inviting me to be here, as well as hosting this event, which I think is really nice to have in Alberta, especially at this time. So I'm going to begin with a little preface about where I'm from and some of these relationships to the words of publishing and distribution as I learned them initially and how I think that's still kind of relevant today. So I'm, I was born in Edmonton, but I grew up in a town called Whitecourt. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's in northern Alberta. And there were... Does anyone know it? I think, okay, good. It's like the place, it's like Red Deer. It's like where you pee on the way to the Alaska Highway uh, to Grand Prairie. So um, basically there were three places that we would spend time kind of when we were there and I learned about publishing and distribution. But White Court, the real name is Sagitawa and it means um, where even the rivers meet, uh, in Cree. And the rivers are the Athabasca and the McLeod River and they meet and they kind of turn into one river. And the other two major things in the town, if you're flying by uh, on 43, is there's two mills. And one of them is Miller Western, and the other one is ANC, which is the Alberta newsprint company. And so it's a pulp and paper mill town. Miller Western is run by the Miller family, and they would cut the wood and the lumber. And uh, it's like covered in boreal forest around there. And they would mill it and ship it, and they would truck it over to ANC. And at ANC mill, that's where they would steam the wood chips, and they'd mix it with water and effluent and solution, and they'd smash it and dry it and flatten it. And you know, as kids, we would play in this stuff, which they'd have outside. We'd jump over the fence and go play in this stuff. And um, then they'd flatten it and they had big machines, and then they would roll it, and they'd turn it into um, reams of paper that were about five feet tall and about five feet wide. And then they would ship those out, and we'd see the paper go out. And it would get cut down to size wherever it was going. And the Miller family, they donated a bunch of money, and they gave this, not a bunch, but like enough. And they, they you know, they gave a oil field trailer to the school that I went to, and they put it out in the field, and we walked through the snow, and they, they put a bunch of Apple computers in there. And there was no instructor, so they told us to make books on, in this, it was called the Apple trailer. And so we'd go and make books, and it was just kind of like a free-for-all in there. And the and what they were, I don't know if you know oil field trailers, but they're like the, the places where pe workers live. And so it was like a really weird like living space where you could like make books and zines and stuff like that. And then the other place we used to hang out a lot where all this stuff used to happen was the hot tubs, which were, um, you know, we didn't have many places to hang out, but there were these two places like near the mills where the effluent would come out in the river and it would be warm. So we would sit in them and we called them the hot tubs and we would swim in them and um, hang out and talk. And then we'd make zines and the hot tubs were like one of the main places we liked to go. And then the library, which we never went there to get books. 
most people were smoking pot behind the library, but um, there, was a, there, was one arti there was no artist in this town, really, uh, that I ever knew, but there was a cartoonist, a political cartoonist, his name was Chris Foyd, and he taught a class at the library and we would all go because it was the best. And, it, and he taught us cartooning. And so he taught me about like the seriousness that's underneath most satire, most humor. But these places like the Apple trailer, the hot tubs in the library, to me they're still like, they still relate to these three core problems of um, publishing and distribution, which are, you know, what material do you print with, whether it's your body or um, paper or, and how do you get the paper? <laughs> like, where does paper come from? And what material, uh, how do you distribute it? And even if it's a computer, like, how do you have access? And I, I'm gonna, you know, use this metaphor to send a very subtle call out to Mia Fusco and say that, no, I completely disagree. There are places that don't have internet in Canada, in Alberta, and in many places in the world. And they don't have libraries and they don't have the books with the authors or the writers of anyone we've spoken about today. And so finding your readers and finding an index or a category or a really nice librarian is not always accessible to everyone. And so that's my preface to the questions today, um, talking about the space that we're in between Yes, I, I do think the category of art writing is still important because if you don't have that context, you don't have an index or an introduction or, or where to even start and how a book can actually send you on a trajectory to other um, spaces you need to be in reading and, and learning. So that's my preface. Um, thank you to everyone who's organized this event and our panel today is on new modes of publishing and distribution and this session is going to ask about how in this space we're between print and online um, formats have shifted between artists writers and and readers and today we're going to hear from some of my favorite um, participants in this field so David Garneau Sky Gooden Emmanuel Aduma and Walter Scott so can you join me in giving them a hand as they join me up here so. Thank you. Yeah, find your home up here. So some of the questions that we were tasked with thinking about include the following. How do the modes of digital storytelling, publishing, and distribution work to assemble or activate different kinds of readers and communities? And through what structures of exchange does art criticism thrive? And how do different serial formats or types of distribution perform new critical perspectives or ecologies? What are the unanticipated afterlives, implying something dies, and futures of digital critical art forms? And so that kind of debate there. And in addition to these questions, during our preparation, we found common points between what could appear to be very differing practices from the panelists here today, but I, we did find a lot of common ground of finding ways to expose, circumvent, or create more equilateral uh, power structures between the existing modes of art criticism and art publishing, overcoming personal fears or enacting bravery by pointing out truths or opinions not spoken publicly or opinions lesser heard, or providing platforms for others to do so, which could be even more important establishing formats of reaching artists and audience more directly, and telling the narratives and the kinds of narratives that you want to read and participate in. And so I'm going to read biographies now. So David Garneau at my far right over there, um, will talk, his talk is called Talk Sweet to Me, Critical Fear and in Indigenous Art. And he's a Métis artist, curator, writer, and associate professor of visual art at the University of Regina. He recently co-curated with Michelle Lavallee, Moving Forward, Never Forgetting at the Mackenzie Art Gallery in Regina, and with Secrecy and Despatch from Tess Alice from the Campbelltown Art Centre in Sydney, Australia. And Garneau has given numerous talks in Australia, New Zealand, and the United States, as well as throughout Canada. And he's part of the Shirk-funded research project, Creative Conciliations, and is working on public art projects in Edmonton. Yes. And his paintings are numerous public and private collections. Uh, then we have Sky, who's actually closest here to me. 
Sky Gooden's talk is called The Changing Landscape of Art Criticism, and Sky is the founding editor of MOMIS, an international online art publication that stresses a return to art criticism. And MOMIS has been critically recognized and widely read and shared, receiving citations from peer publications including Freeze, Eflux, The New Inquiry, and LA Times, among others. And the publication was shortlisted for two international art criticism awards in 2016. As it approaches its third anniversary, MOMIS has grown to an audience of over 600,000 readers, and it's now producing Momus, the podcast, and during this first season, it is syndicated by the popular UK-based NTS Radio, and is working on its first print edition to be released this fall. Gooden holds an art history BFA from Concordia University and an MFA in criticism and curatorial practice from OCAD University, which in 2016 awarded her with an Alumni of Influence Award, the Trailblazer. Emmanuel Duma. You want to raise your hand? Um, the Promise of Mutability. Emmanuel is a Nigerian writer and art critic who I just got to know during this conference, which is amazing because I've been reading your work for a while. Um, he holds a um, sorry, MFA in art criticism and writing from the School of Visual Arts in New York, where he's also a faculty member. And he's contributed essays on art and photography to a number of journals, magazines, and exhibition catalogs. He is the editor of Saramba Magazine, which he co-founded. And until 2016, he was the director of publications of Invisible Borders, a trans-African organization based in Nigeria, and participated in four editions of its acclaimed road trip project. He played a curatorial role in the group's installation of Trans-African World Space at the 2015 Venice Biennale, and he co-curated the Nigerian Pavilion at the 2017 Venice Biennale. He is the author of the novel, The Sound of Things to Come, which you should pick up, there's only a few left. First published as Farad in Nigeria, co-editor of Gambit, Newer African Writing, and his latest book, A Stranger's Pose, will be published in 2018. And Walter Scott, you wanna raise your hand, Walter? Uh, wrote, is the author of Wendy, a uh, comic, uh, a satire on the art world, will be um, Walter's presentation. And he's a Canadian interdisciplinary artist working in writing, illustration, performance, and sculpture. In 2011, while living in Montreal, Scott started his Wendy comic book series, and the series tells a fictional story of a young woman who aspires to art stardom, but whose plans are constantly being derailed. The incredibly popular Wendy series has now been serialized on Random House Canada's literary digital magazine, Hazlitt. Scott has exhibited across Canada, and some of his recent exhibitions include Joan Dark at Western Front in 2014, pre-existing work at Macaulay and Co-Fine Art in Vancouver in 2015, and Stopping the Sun in Its Course at Francois Gebelet Gallery in Los Angeles 2015, and in 2014, Scott was artist in residence in Yokohama, Japan, as well as the artist run, uh, sorry, artist in residence at the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto in 2016. So these are really accomplished people and an amazing mix of speakers. We're going to have them each do their presentation, then I'm going to interject. I have a question for each of you on your presentation, and then some general questions, and we can open up the floor. So join me in welcoming them one more time, and we'll begin. Thank you. So I'm honored to be here in Calgary, Treaty 7 territory in the traditional lands of the Blackfoot, Sigsika, Pakani, Gainai, Tsutsina, Stony and Dakota First Nations, and also home to some Métis and Inuit. Thank you to Lisa, um, Joanne, Pierre, Nate, and Christy. So my paper's a little bit off topic, I apologize. I intended to talk about how the growing digital archive of art images and texts alters our experience of time how it blends past and present, making digital time closer to an indigenous sense of simultaneity, I knew I didn't lose this one, simultaneity, you get the idea, <laughs> then modernism's chronology, and how this might affect current art making, curation, and reception. I also want to discuss the rhetorical strategies of informal indigenous criticism of indigenous art on social media. But I feel the need to consider something more basic and pressing the fear of criticism that surrounds Indigenous art, and after listening to everybody in the last couple of days, the general fear of criticism. Perhaps we can consider the other topics during the conversation portion of the panel. So let me start with this. Five years ago, Australian, Aust Australian artist Vernon Aki lamented the dearth of criticism of Aboriginal art. That was a quotation. 
He argued that the reason no one had ever criticized his work was because they were afraid. Five or 10 years ago, I spoke with Anishinaabe performance artist Rebecca Belmore about the need for indigenous art criticism. She agreed and then growled, but who would dare? <laughs> Last July, I talked with Alex Javier. His National Gallery of Canada retrospective is currently touring the country. He is one of our most revered living painters. While appreciating his many tributes, Alex surprised me by saying that his one regret, his one regret, was the lack of criticism about his work. He had received plenty of press, but no criticism. Most people wince at criticism. Why are these senior artists asking for it? Why is sweet talk not enough for indigenous contemporary artists? Criticism is a requirement for any artist who wants currency in the art world. Published critique differentiates contemporary art from non-innovative commercial art and from customary culture. The desire for criticism is not reducible to a wish for publicity. For the artist, it is a need to have your efforts noticed, read, and tested in the arenas you are informed by, engage, and respect. It is the need to know if your art makes the contribution you think it does, and to learn what it is in your work that you reflected or intuited and expressed without fully understanding. For the writer and reader, critical art writing is about trying to understand something that has not already been digested by our collective critical consciousness. Art worth writing about is a bizarre, an irritant, a compact accumulation of what the social gut cannot quite digest, a hairball coughed up. It lies there until diviners dissect and read into it social meaning. Art moves us Effectively, we sense significance, we intuit associations, but writing as reading puts these feelings into words, analyzes, interprets, and turns insights into knowledge, which is readiness for action. Critical reception completes a work without exhausting it. It reads the visual into text into, 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 sorry, it reads a visual into text and to public discourse where it becomes a new object in relation. An exhibition is a mere collection of things until activated by individual subjective experiences, but it only makes an intra-subjective impact. It only has social meaning and influence when it is read, interpreted, discussed, activated in public critical engagement. To suspend judgment about a quality of a whole class of artworks because they were made by a particular race of people is problematic. Now you may have noticed that we're in the midst of an explosion of interest in indigenous art. Lots of exhibitions and magazine articles. However, most of the writing has the character of artist profile or general con con contextualization. Very few of these texts are criticism in the sense of deep readings of specific works in an evaluation of their quality and an analysis of the artist project, its contribu contribution to the field and beyond. There's plenty of sweet talk but a fear of criticism, and for good reason. Native art has only been, been recognized as art by mainstream institutions for just over a generation. Considered craft and her culture when visible at all, it fell under ethnography and anthropology, and those fields were rarely interested in post-Indian Act natives, artists whose activities were contaminated in, by, by contact in their judgment, rather than seen as creative adaptations. Audiences for most Indian and Inuit art prior to the 1990s were customers. Commercial dealers require affectionate writing about their artists. Narratives about the rough, self-taught genius who rise above despair, stories of benevolent patrons who saw value where others did not, tales of lines of authentic creative succession, etc. But they absolutely fear criticism. Words that might neg negatively affect the value of their stock and stable, words that might affect appetite. And I'm thinking of appetite in Dylan Robinson's and Neil McLeod's sense of settler hunger as a disorder. Similarly, old school non-Indigenous investors in native art, who are also invested in Indianism, love when their favorite artists' personal lives are interrogated. It adds color. But evaluations that exceed biography and appreciation, analysis that might negatively affect the value of their status symbols, makes them anxious. 
But this ph phenomenon is not really reducible to money and status. It has the character of an unconscious drive, a complex. The settler need for native artists to repeat, to keep making things, to keep making them things, the same old things anew, the need for art that simultaneously remembers and forgets, that calls into presence and disguises, is a need for a controlled, repetitive, consumable nativeness, inexhaustible packets of compensation that can be swallowed by the eyes like a medicine. Such work cannot bear reading, cannot bear being read, being brought to consciousness. Such things are non-discursive objects. They are exempt from criticism. So I'm referring here to the vast range of what I call screen objects that native people produce for settler consumption, and not the class of things that does have content, but that just cannot yet be read. For example, a few years ago, um, what's that fancy building here, big tile tower? I was in there and Alex Janvier had a bunch of paintings and I was kind of appalled because that particular company has not done kind by his territory. And I asked him about that and he just laughed. He says, they have no idea what's on their walls. I can, un I can unpack that later about territorial claims. Oh, sorry, I'm one slide ahead. Uncritical patronage of native art is patronizing. It abandons evaluation to taste, to the preferences of the non-native marketplace whose desire for aestheticized Indianness is not always in the best interest of living native people. The settler-owned and operated commercial native art world produces or protects their artists from outside influence for the sake of authenticity. I'm particularly thinking of old style Inuit art and uh, Austrian Ab Aboriginal art. Artists in this situation produce survival art with guidance from middlemen, Indian agents. Their artworks are reserved to a special eddy off to the side of the art's mainstream, and the artists are isolated from those larger currents. Such artists barely, are barely conscious of the larger social, historical, political, and economic workings that compel them not to produce art for themselves and their community, but to labor for colonial masters, to reproduce romanticized, undisturbed decorations for settler pleasure and consumption. Of course, this was in the past, before the mid-1980s. It persists, but is in eclipse because many artists and curators, indigenous artists and curators, have abandoned Indianness for indigeneity. The National Gallery of Canada did not collect contemporary native art until 1986 when it purchased Carl Beam's North American Iceberg. And native curators were not invited to organize large exhibitions until Expo 67's The Indians of Canada Pavilion. The challenge that event produced and discouraged subsequent invitations for nearly a quarter of a century. The mood changed after the Oka crisis of 1990 uh, sorry, the Oka resistance of 1990, the work of the Minquan Panchayat and many others, and more substantively in our present period of multi-level mobilization following Idle No More and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. When native artists were still Indians and mostly reflected a beautiful stylized nature and expressed the tradition, traditional aspects of their cultures, the commercial market loved it. But the, but the contemporary art world turned up their nose. What changed? First Nations Inuit Métis people rose up and actively confronted Canada and colonization. They slipped past their local elected Indian Act leaders and performed as political but non-state actors. Native artists slipped past the conventional, uh, conventional mar commercial art market and expressed themselves in modes and styles familiar to the mainstream contemporary art world. And most importantly, Indigenous artists and writers made settler people and anti-colonialism their subjects. It was only when addressed directly, when publicly ref reflected and criticized, could dominant art institutions see Indigenous contemporary art. Now Indigenous contemporary art holds up a mirror to settlers rather than to nature or to their own people. It's, a very, po it's very popular among a certain class of settlers. Art that illustrates what they have recently come to know about themselves in forms they comprehend that pricks but does not draw blood is very useful to settlers. Given this history and the current, current panic around the so-called reconciliation and, and indigenization, it is no surprise that critical reception of indigenous art is in an anxious state. 
Non-Indigenous critics fear not knowing how an to analyze and respond to art that seems partially belong a dis belonging to a discourse not their own. They fear being obsolete. They fear being called racist. Many are appropriately anxious about replicating colonial modes. The president art writing mode, when not merely fawning, are literary artworks inspired by visual ones, but not critical of them. Critical engagement requires having ground to stand upon, making meaning, world building. For their part, indigenous artists are anxious about having their, words, their works misread. They fear aesthetic and critical assimilation, and we have something to be anxious about. Being native is about being grounded in a particular territory and histories, being tethered to community, humbled and checked by relations with the local engaged in active sovereignties. It includes metaphysical, for real, not metaphorically. These necessary relational essentialisms are at fundamental odds with academic cosmopolitan materialism. Indigenous critical writers such as they are do not want to estrange their friends and relatives, share knowledge they should not, or be illegible either to the art world or to their communities. The situation is complex and fragile. So this is a rough, wet draft of uh, a keynote I'll give in Banff in a few weeks. Um, so all the contradictions and errors will be all cleaned up by then. <laughs> So part of the problem is categorical. To call oneself an indigenous artist rather than just an artist is to claim that your art expresses both your specific native cultural identity and participates in an art world. This may suggest a hybridity whose parts can be distinguished from their whole, can be mentally teased apart, but no person or work of art lives in two camps equally and unproblematically. Native traditionalists, for example, are unlikely to recognize works and persons that violate customary style by engaging in the mainstream art world. Similarly, invisibility and distortions occur when critical writers apply modernist critical methods and colonial forms of evaluation to works that attempt to elude and resist those styles. I'm speaking, for instance, about this class of works now, as, for instance, the performances of Rebecca Balmore, Adrian Stimson, Terence Uhl, Amy Melboff, and many, many others and everything that happens at Tanya Willard's Bush Gallery and Walking With Our Sisters exhibition and its challenge to curatorial practice, and there's so much more. So my argument is that these new works and practices belong to a third space, the indigenous. The indigenous is the name given by native persons whose identities and practices include but exceed both their home communities and the colonial nations that attempt to describe and contain them. Indigenous is a set of contemporary relations and practices. Indigenous is rooted in a specific territory, but is concerned with all our relations. Indigenous contemporary art emerges from one's customary culture and circulates in the dominant art world, but mostly it occupies its own circulatory system, its own irreconcilable spaces of aboriginality. And Alex is a precursor. Alex may be the first indigenous artist, that is, to say the first to create a style that was recognizably native but belongs to no specific customary tribal style. His paintings are physically and spiritually rooted in a specific territory, the Cold Lake area, but they are also in dialogue with European modernism. However, his work is not wedded to a specific non-objective modernist school and is filled with the sort of political content that most of them endeavored to escape. Janvier comes from northern Alberta and lives there still. He is well educated by both his community standards and in the ways recognized by name, mainstream Canada. He was the first native person to graduate from art school at ACA in 1960. He owns the means of production and distribution. He doesn't have a d dealer. His wife uh, takes care of all the sales. And if you've worked with her, she's tough. <laughs> Perhaps most importantly, Jean Vier and his colleagues were pathfinders who initiated Indigenous aesthetic professional discourse on a national scale. They formed the uh, Professional Native Indian Artist Incorporation, also known as the Indian Group of Seven. They were a collective that developed ideas and strategies for coping with the existing commercial art world. Now in his 80s, Alex Janvier continues to participate in, in Indigenous discourse in artist residencies at Banff, Thompson Rivers University, and the Summer Indigenous Intensive at the University of British Columbia in Kelowna and elsewhere. I'm almost done. Currently, Indigenous discourse is mostly talk, conversations that have helped inspire artistic and curatorial production for several decades. 
Most recently in the past 10 years or so, Indigenous artists, curators, writers and their allies have been meeting in an Indigenous-led gathering such as those organized by the Aboriginal Curatorial Collective, the Creative Conciliations Group, the Initiative for Indigenous Futures, Primary Colours coming up next week, the Summer Indigenous Intensive at the University of British Columbia in Kelowna, and many other symposia, conferences, talks, talking and meeting circles. There are meetings that have also occurred in Australia and New Zealand, and more recently among the Sami. In these spaces, natives produce new ideas and relationships that are shaping Indigenous contemporary art and identities. These efforts recently bolstered in Canada by a huge increase in commitment and funding by the Canada Council are generating a sea change in critical writing about Indigenous art, one that acknowledges the Indigenous contemporary art and artists are not best served by settler style, adversarial, shame-based modernist criticism, even if written by native critics. What we now need to develop are non-colonial modes of extra rational critical care. Thank you. Thank you. Next up we have Scott. Oh sorry. Yeah, you're not asking him a question. Um, why don't we do other questions at the end? Or is that okay? Yeah, that's what's it. Thank you for having me. Um, I confess to being nervous. I've given talks like this dozens of times in the last three years, but I'm in a room full of my peers and some personal heroes. And um, so if I fall over at some point, it's just out of respect for you. <laughs> um, and my deepest gratitude to the team at Contemporary Calgary. I'm so impressed that you were able to put something on this level together and uh, chuffed to be Canadian. Okay. So I'm going to talk um, a bit about the work I'm doing with MOMIS and, uh, and the context that I, I produced it in, the, the reasons for, for initiating this um, three years ago. I entered into a crisis, uh, more or less. I started professionally working in this capacity about seven years ago, which was just sort of uh, at the tail end of what was being called a crisis in criticism, although uniquely really only by critics. And it was, um, it, this is probably something a lot of you will be familiar with. It was at the, it was the work of largely American critics um, that round tables and books were being produced to uh, discuss exactly what was at the center of that crisis and uh, very little agreement could be found among them. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but not too much. Um, but that was sort of me coming into the scene was uh, to the sound of a car alarm almost. And it wasn't the car alarm of a vehicle being violated, it was one suffering neglect. For myself, um, what inspired me to move into this field particularly was a short stint, um, a sort of grant-funded um, stint at the at Toronto University Gallery, where I was being asked, among other things, to uh, sort of walk through the tall grass of over a 1,000 pieces of criticism published between 1960 and 1990, roughly, in Canada, uh, of course, all in print. and. Um, and really just do surface editing. I mean, I wasn't being asked to do anything substantial in that capacity, but it was an education I had not yet received, in fact. Um, and it was an opportunity to go long and go deep with some of the critics that I would come to admire so greatly. What that meant to me, though, and this is, by the way, is the database where they live. It's a dinosaur, but it's a great treasure as well. So I would recommend spending some time with it. Um, I, uh, I looked around me after doing that work and during the time of that work, it was 2010, and recognized that uh, the critical moment that I was entrenched in, in doing that research and that editing, uh, was no longer taking root. Um, the urgency and bravery with which people were writing, the clarity with which people were writing, and the kind of dialogue that, and that work can start to feel a bit cheap, but really there was like some talking going on between critics from Vancouver to Halifax and everything in between. Um, I looked around me and it was a much paler moment that I was um, coming up in uh, with publications largely in Canada on the shelf, not online, a question I still sort of have about why we've lagged in that regard. Um, and, and stalwart publications all, three, at least three of them around for 30 years more, uh, the top three in particular, I believe, 
um, have deep, deep histories and have done very good work. But suddenly, um, whatever had been at the fore of our minds and our hearts in that earlier period of our contemporary art history um, had slipped. And this, this more or less is still true today in terms of the scope of what we have in terms of online art publishing in Canada. So as some of you will know, and I don't um, plan to cite this for long, but I, my entry into this field professionally was um, to run the Canadian version of um, Blue End Art Info, sort of an empire, or at least one with those kinds of ambitions based in New York. Um, and I, it, it was a brilliant opportunity because I had a salary and a staff, and I was 27 years old with a criticism degree. So like, what happened there? But I got very lucky to sort of be the beneficiary of benign neglect from the New York office, and I could sort of just run the show as I saw fit. So what I wanted to do was approach exactly that dearth of evaluative criticism. And really that's the word that I like to underscore when I'm talking about what was lacking. Um, I won't bring up a slide of that. That was a good three hour, three hour, three year job, and then um, and it bottomed out. So I, from there, uh, swung into, pun you know, punched out of a corner basically financially and started um, an online criticism publication, which was really savvy, really, um, in terms of financial health. Um, <laughs> This is just a screenshot of James Elkin's book that I, um, I wore, I, I read uh, frontwards and backwards um, around that time. So as, as many of you will know, the key tenets of uh, the crisis, quote unquote, and really quotes should be maintained around that term at all times, because in hindsight, I think we can see that it was something slightly less dramatic, although I, I mean, I'd be happy to talk about that, but um, the key tenets of uh, what they were arguing over um, being the crisis was uh, that the academic influence um, and popularity of MFA programs in French theory and any number of other things had sort of uh, was starting to run sort of slipshod over um, uh, a more pedantic, not pedantic, more pedestrian form of criticism, or at least a more accessible kind of criticism. The other argument was that an inflated and streamlined art market was no longer making room for the reflection that criticism requires. And finally, that there was a destabilization of the critic as authority, which I think we can all agree was welcome, but it had um, its effects. There are any number of other things. This is so cursory, it's not funny, but you get the idea. So that was the moment in which I, um, I decided to not only start this publication, which notably is not Canadian, although I am based in Toronto, but international in its scope, because I don't really think online publishing um, has any place um, being sort of nationalistic. It is the World Wide Web, after all. And that also gives you an idea of why I was uh, sort of giving this mantle to it, a return to art criticism, which three years later perhaps is up for um, some revisement. So what I'm going to do right now is just sort of flip through about 20 screenshots of the work that we've published in the last three years while I read you a brief intro to the print book that we're publishing, a compendium uh, in October 2017, which by the way, I meant to sort of do a proper plug uh, at the book launch today. That book will be available at Edition Toronto at the end of October, which is an art book fair entering into its sophomore year. And Dushko Petrovich, who's in the office, in the office, in the audience today, is uh, among our uh, laureled speakers for that. Oh, before I do, here are some of our mandates. <laughs> for the past three years, MOMIS has dedicated itself to crafting a singular tone from a multitude of talented contributors' voices, one sufficient to the vital, uphill work of a critic in a mostly uncritical time. However, we confess to experiencing regular doubt lately about what art criticism, oh, the problem is I'm wearing my glasses, here we go. However, we confess to experiencing regular doubt lately about what art criticism can contribute to the fray when the world order is being tipped into disarray. Just wanna make sure we're rolling. So we take comfort and strength in remembering that just as art history provides the all-important subjective lens for parsing our histories, art criticism performs a similar function 
In writing and publishing art criticism, we hold the contemporary moment up to the court of history and lay claim to a stake for how we and our time will be understood. MoMA's writers wield this responsibility and challenge with an embodied understanding of the urgency of writing cogently, clearly, and bravely about our contemporary moment. Their voices have led our publication into a different tonal register, this past year especially, a ratcheting up of meaning, a growing impatience with pat, tacit political understandings, or obscuritanism of any kind. Indeed, our vision from the outset was to provide a reprieve from and rebuke against the toxic poles of elitism and populism that frame so much public conversation. We advanced a mandate of skepticism without cynicism, accessibility without infantilism, and, in, and, oh, sorry, and an imperative, both aesthetic and political, to read a cultural text more deeply. As we mark our three-year anniversary, we can begin to see what we've created, a forum for online writing that is slow, careful, and considered, a return to art criticism that matters. Our writers have taught us in recent months especially that the work of a critic is less and less, as 1860s critic Matthew Arnold said, quote, to be, to be a free play of the mind on all subjects which it touches. And more and more, what contemporary critic Peter Sheldell proposed, our, quote, trying to move the world over and make it more habitable for our own sensitivity. So criticism is not selfless but increasingly, it cannot waste space. We will he heed this and simply say that in a year where Momus' readership crested 600,000, saw us launch a podcast and produce this, our first print publication, here is some of our strongest testimony to date, 21 writers speaking truth to power in history's court. So, um, what else did I want to talk to you about? Oh, I'm just going to finish these slides. I will say, um, as a sort of aside, that some of the work that we do, much as it's international in scope, and we're really just taking the best pitches that arrive to us without um, any determination around the kinds of subjects that we speak to. It's not that we're looking to cover certain exhibitions, for instance, so much as hear from writers that have something to say. Um, but one of um, my objectives has always been to speak to criticism itself, which, albeit, is a niche audience, probably just about everybody here. But um, but not many more, <laughs> um, around sort of the health of criticism, the state of it. And, and again, that sort of feeds back into um, the place from which this was born. So as you can see, there's some writing here that speaks exactly to something I'm speaking about today. And certainly, I was entering into an arena that um, was a healthy one. At least it was beginning to pink up, as they say. So um, some of the critics that I'm looking to right now are on the screen above, but I revise this screen every two months very happily um, because the number of voices that are starting to articulate themselves and put an elbow through the drywall um, is outstanding. And really, on online publishing is where I'm seeing most of those um, voices speak, so to speak. And of course, the arena is a very rich one in terms of um, the kinds of publications that I'm happy to call peers. Um, and you'll get a sense of it here. This is not comprehensive, but it's a, it's a fairly good crack at it. So here is our masthead as of uh, this moment. You'll see that we've got a few critics working out of Latin America. Some of our bravest writers, in fact, are working out of Latin America. It's not an easy place to be brave. And, um, and we're obviously uh, rooting people into Europe as well as across North America. But I'm very excited to be working um, with writers in Asia, writers who are indigenous, and, and more. So we've got ambitions to continue to fold outwards in the year to come. Uh, we put out an ebook once a year. The most recent one is a couple weeks old. You can read it for free online and download it. 
We've got a podcast now, which is an hour's conversation among critics um, that allows for a kind of loosening of the knots and um, a sort of less formal, more breathing um, chat about some of the things that uh, remain issues or um, come, a, come a cropper. Most recently, um, an hour, de well, for our pilot, an hour devoted to talking about the Venice Biennale, not this year's, but as an institution and its relevance to us um, and impasses in politics. So it's a pretty fantastic chat and humor is not absent. Um, and we've got a full season rolling out starting next month. And our print book, this is part of the cover, which I'm thrilled about, if nervous about, because I really care about uh, giving primacy to online publishing and making sure that this doesn't look like something I was just doing until I could afford a print book. <laughs> And finally, a few stats about where we're at, some of which were covered in the bio, so I won't belabor the points. I'd like to end, i um, not sure where I am for time, but this is what's happening. I'd like to end with uh, a couple questions that I'm asking myself as I go forward, and the things that are spurring me and getting me out of bed with white knuckles every day. How do you move on from a return? So now that we can perhaps agree in this room we are in a pretty healthy state of art criticism uh, or art writing, although that's a term I use less, um, what would it look like to push it forward and where does it need to go and what does that, how do you summarize um, the ambition of that good work? How can we be equal to our object? I'll let that one float. Who benefits and who should pay for it? This is a big question for me because it's a huge mantle of what we're doing to be paying well above industry average rates, which is not a hard, hard bar to pass, by the way. It's a pretty disappointingly low one in online publishing. Um, but the question I'm continuing to return to in, my, in myself and with, with my staff is, who's responsible? Um, is it the galleries? It's certainly not the artists. Um, I'm grateful to have patrons, but it's not necessarily something you want to count on. So how does this, how do we push this forward with a sense of um, who's netting the effort? How do we slow things down in a medium that suggests we should move on? I have a great amount of faith in and stock in online readerships. Um, in terms of the kind of patience I see in them and engagement I see in them. And certainly Momus, I think, uh, sits uniquely in a pack of online publications in terms of how long readers tend to spend with their articles, which is between five and 10 minutes. Um, the average, I think, is like 20 seconds um, for online reading. So I'm happy to sit in um, a place apart. But um, it does mean that we have to be um, fighting for your attention, and hopefully that doesn't diminish the writing that we do. Um, you have to sort of sell yourself, as with journalism in, in print newspapers, above the fold. You have to sell your argument, you have to make your case. So how do we condition ourselves to online impatience and distraction um, while not um, giving ourselves over to a diminished or watered, um, watery or, or sort of uh, frenetic form of writing? And I guess um, that leads me to this question. How do we tap into and lead online readership's potential to be attentive, patient, and engaged? And finally, has the crisis left or just moved? Thanks very much. Thank you, Scott. It was great. Uh, Manuel Duma is next. Hi. Hello. Okay, I, I don't know if I'm nervous or not, so um, let's see what happens. Um, okay. Am I supposed to point it to you? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, so I'll just stand on existing protocol and thank everyone for Yes, um, and, um, and thank Joanne and Lisa and everyone who has made our stay here just incredible. Um, I'm going to talk about a very strange way of practicing criticism, I guess, um, talk about my work on Instagram in the last couple of months. And um, um, yeah, let's see what happens. <laughs> 
So the first part of the talk is going to be uh, mostly just looking at some of the slides directly from Instagram. And on the next version of the, I mean, the second part of the talk would be looking at some of the images that I've um, selected from an archive and then reading some accompanying text. There are 48 posts on my Instagram feed with images downloaded from the Flickr page of the National Archives UK, the Na International Mission Photography Archive, and from Romani Cagnoni's coverage of the Biafra War. All the images I chose were taken in Nigeria. In each post, I have paired the images with lines of text. Much scholarship exists in colonial era photographs. My work was to find complementary, perhaps alternative vibrations, to consider these strangers in the archive my kin. I am writing into their lives, lives that enter mine, how audacious. If I profile my memories and encounters, my losses and anxieties, it is not to explain away identities I know nothing about, to see instead how the personal becomes the personable. Not two made into one, but two made into three. The correspondence between images and text produce, produces a thought presence. What is formed in the interaction between the image, my text, and your, and your engagement. When you swipe left or when the tip of your index finger taps an icon to produce a reddish glow. When your face hovers over the image and caption. Two made into three. The empire is relentless and so much resistance to it. Neither statement is any truer today than in 1914, when two protectorates in Nigeria was amalgamated into a single administrative entity. What has changed is the language in which we express our fortitude and with which we console each other. As Bruno Schulz writes, what is to be done with events that have no place in their own time, of their own in time, events that have occurred too late after the whole of time have have been distributed, divided, and allotted, events that have been left in the cold, unregistered, hanging in the air, homeless and errant. End of quote. He continues, could it be that time is too narrow for all events? Could it be that all the seats within time have, might have been sold? Worried, we run along the train of events, preparing ourselves for the journey. 48 is the number of verses in my favorite psalm, Psalm 139, doubled. Reiterations, reverberations, and resonances interest me, as well as remembering the process of recoupling an event. If the whole of time have been distributed, divided, and allotted, it might be worthwhile to revisit those times again and cast the shadow of the present against the past. I make a distinction between history as event and history as consciousness. In history as event, time is linear and facts are sacred. In history as consciousness, time erupts and is disrupted and facts are, the only, first, are only the first version of truths. The distinctions are broad but promising. Now, this is the more crucial point. To consider my work on Instagram criticism is in a sense to do work that attempts to interrogate the nature of social media time. Social media, as we know and use it, thrives on the near immediate obsolescence of our captions, pictures, and memes. The thoughts are as knee-jerk as they are ephemeral, and even if they live on in our feeds and profile, they are removed from the past to such a degree that perhaps they didn't exist in the first place. Anything depicted on Instagram as such shares the same fate as products that become redundant after a while. I suppose then that to place archival images, photographs on Instagram, captioned in the way I have, is to place two parallel times side by side, a time of instant obsolescence and a time of historical consciousness. Both compete for attention in the moment of encounter. And just like memory, a given moment is not subject to linear time. My work on Instagram has proceeded from this assumption. My posts are, uh, OK, that's the first image of the second section. <laughs> Um, my posts are admittedly energized by conceits. They exist within a system of likes, comments, DMs, and reposts. They are intended for an audience already using Instagram as an extension of their private lives. It is even further conceited to assume that I could, 
interrupt the frivolous flow of information with something more thoughtful. And yet, in developing new work this past six months, I have held myself accountable to the medium. For if the time of social media is instantly, in, is instantly obsolescent and ensures words already allotted and distributed, I'm keen on uploading words to be read more slowly, like glitches. I perceive that this is partly inspired by how John Berger considered himself in relation to his life work as a stopgap man rather than a professional or consequential writer. The captions become stories read for immediate effects. Every concept awaits its transformation into feeling. So now I'd like to read some of those captions and show you the photographs that accompany them. And to be fair, some of these were edited for the purpose of today's talk. As strangers, we are bound to a collective fate. The world has a storehouse for all the names and gestures we share. Occasionally, it outreaches its bounds. Your past replaced as my future, my present backdated until yours arrives. Time is shuffled. After a recent talk I gave, two women came to me, but showed me photographs on their phones. The first photograph was of twin girls who rarely dressed in the same clothes their mother said, or cut their hair the same way as the photo showed. But in that photograph, their clothes were alike. Twins are the quintessential expression of intimate strangers, I said in my talk. I disagreed with you, the first woman, mother of twins, said, told me. Then I thought it over and began to agree, provisionally at first, until I became utterly convinced. The second photograph was of a young man my age, perhaps older, whose mother, showing me his photograph, was setting what looked alike. He was handsomer than I imagined myself looking, yet she insisted on our likeness, even in the way you move your hands, your smile, and he's a poet you see like you. You speak the same way. I've thought often of those women, their children, who I become in the light of others. All those, to whom I, all those to whom I entrust the meaning of my life, its promise, its secret ambitions, and unnameable longings, they are contraband. I smuggle them into my heart, my hands folded in prayer. Stay with me. There is below every name the underbelly of a life. If it were possible, I'll ask for people and things to go nameless until the dusk of their lives. Humans at the outset of their last breaths, plants crumpled by air and feet just before they fail to rise again, a beast in the final winds and gasp of pain. That way, names can achieve their real intent to sum and give character to a life. I see during the course of my travels a vast number of people whose names I will never know, but whose lives are befittingly characterized by their poise and pose. The man who stands with an arm resting on a wall, I can estimate with what commitment he walks, his hands touch the membrane of the wall as a herdsman touches the skin of a favorite sheep. The concrete is caressed. The, the mud is fingered. There is even desire in the reach of his hands. He loves all houses as he loves his own skin. To know his birth name, Ibrahim, Joe, Mustafa, Aliyu, Ikemefuna, or Garik, becomes less interesting than to comprehend what meaning his hands convey. It occurs to me that all struggle to be named to portray an identity in spite of can be typified in the way a body is pictured. Let the incline of an elbow remind us of a gangly man near exhausted by years of itinerancy. Let graying mustache remind us of commensurate experience, a master embodying his mastery. And let bare feet, a furrowed forehead, and a doorway indicate a man mildly irritated by having to pause mid activity to pose for a photograph. Lovers know this, but need often to be reminded. No desire is misplaced. Might take years to fathom even half a century. As a river knows itself a tributary, so desire travels, surrendering, undulating. The woman turns away. She designates the terms with which she is to be approached, the limits of engagement, her sidelong her glance sidelong, any gaze meets hers uncooperative. 
Again and again, her body unrelenting in its refusal, like unmapped landscape, is an evocation of distance. The man I know, the man I am, long versed in refusing women their recalcitrance. Well, now they insist. If I report from the front line of desire, it is to narrate how shamed I am by women who wouldn't turn to or remain with me. Why does she turn away? A photograph is an approximation, has its flesh imprinted on paper, a presence abridged into a split instant. If then there is no meaning but an approximate one, why do I shiver from ignorance, the deficit of context? Whether for a canary woman, a sidelong glance is the customary way of approaching a, ca a camera to deflect the omen that might be cast by onlookers at open eyes. Or if at the moment of being pictured she was asked to turn away, the photographer's attempt to present her in profile. Or suppose the photograph is meant to depict the side of her face with marks, permanent scars of belonging. I do not know. I am unable to know. I mistrust what I perceive. Perhaps in the solemnity of her pose, her arms gathered in self-embrace, she retreats what is lost. I now see why the word on the tip of my tongue when I first looked at these photographs was desire. Desire is sanctioned by loss. As memories accrete, the absence of a loved one is a loss of favorite images, which, despite all attempts, cannot be recalled. What did she look like in that yellow gown, her lips pouted or her arms akimbo? How did he appear standing beside a brown pillar, with or without a heart? When we camped overnight at the beach, whose phone was used for the photo of the skyline at sundown. There is one other way to meditate on the averted glances. Suppose a visage seen in full is repository for a truth so personal, common language falters in an attempt to describe. Not seen in full, what a special intelligence is obscured, what hint of peculiar revelation inaccessible. Two women pictured in a similar way, in a similar manner, are likely for the photographer ethnographic proof of how female canary native types distinguish themselves from their dequa neighbors, for instance. For me, simply and resolutely, resolutely, I wonder about individual destiny. Which woman was hassled by her husband to pose for the photograph so he might enter into favor with the local chief? Which, seeing her friend cradle a photograph, sought to avenge her envy by seizing what seemed the final opportunity? What was her mood that afternoon? What beauty did she think could be preserved even for a second? What neglect, what vein of longing, what crooked finger of tenderness, what neat's favorite dress, what bracelet weathered by irreplaceable affection? However damnable the presumptions of the photographer, one must seek the flash of meaning that redeems the image from the onerous past, the pinprick of light that saves a room from utter darkness. A woman I know when she was about 10 or a little older was accused of being possessed by the devil. She does not remember on what occasion her actions as a precocious, headstrong child gave her off, but there is a moment in her memory when she's kneeling and cycled, encircled by a praying group from our childhood Presbyterian church. After a session of prayers, she's asked to recant her allegiance to Satan. In practice, no recantation is complete without naming one's companions. She made up identities of her cohorts, accusing schoolmates she dis disliked or recalcitrant girls in church. You know I don't believe in those things, she said. Once, her mother asked if she had had a hand in the end of a preacher's marriage, a man who visited her family regularly. She nodded in agreement. No other response had been envisaged. Once also, a little past midnight, a as a little girl, a visiting woman forcefully woke her. The visitor struck her chest repeatedly, your heart is very hard. She was unsure if by striking her chest, the woman hoped to make her spirit softer, less involved with the devil. What she recalls was saying nothing to her parents about that night, telling no one all these years except me since I solicit for her past. At the end of her recollection, she says, I hope you won't put my name in what you're writing. I will let her anonymity stand. I'll just move on because I can't find the text that goes with that. 
There are those who know in landscape only true regrets, what's unmapped, who lies buried or awaiting burial, what's trodden or underfoot. I say to them, and I say to you, hold your arms as far from your body as you possibly can, not to possess or compress, but to comprehend. When looking at landscape, the eye journeys only as far as it can. A place is limitless, but what we see of it isn't. The ramifications of our gaze are subjective, that is, subject to a limitation of perspective, only as far as. The photograph landscape is a permanent indication of what the eye saw in parts. In a photograph, the delimited gaze is doubly delimited. And then finally, which is probably my favorite, <laughs> let me take shade under you, says one lover to another. It is a metaphor that refers unambiguously to trees. If a tree supplies human lovers with language for comfort and consolation, it is precisely because of scale. How does a tree manage to maintain its balance in the air? Drendologists tell us that trees, as they evolve into upright plants, face the problem of gravity. The aerial parts of the tree are pulled downward by wind and rain, so the tree, if it must survive, has to orient itself in relation to gravity. While new shoots grow up, new, shoots, new roots grow down. This geotropic response is generalization. Sometimes shoots grow at, grow at an angle or vertically, and in trees with millions of roots, very few incline downwards. And yet, at the outset of its life, a tree's immediate concern is to solve its gravity problem, reaching at once for height and depth. I remember sitting beside her in a Lagos restaurant in the days we still believed we would get married. I avoided her eyes, although in fact she turned away from the table to ensure she didn't look at me. Lovers of our kind, those who had spent a year apart in long distance affairs are dissatisfied when they momentarily reunite. They want each other's endless devotion, but time is too short. The analogy is tricky, but consider a love affair as a tree solving its gravity problem. How we might grow downwards with continued affection for each other, at the same time remain rooted, although our lives are compromised by the intimate details we have of each other's flaws. The push of affection, the pull of knowledge. To stay in love, we orient ourselves in relation to gravity. Thank you. Thank you, that was beautiful. Walter. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation, Lisa, Joanne. Uh, thank you, Contemporary Calgary. Thank you, everybody here. Um, I have a plane to catch, so at exactly 4 p.m., if I stand up and get my coat, and leave, and you never see me again? That's why. How does it work? The top one? Pretend you didn't see any of that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Hey, you made it. I'm exhausted. I just got back from an artist talk in Berlin. I have a video installation showing there. <laughs> oh, cool, yeah, I might show there. My friend knows about this art space in Berlin. Whatever, everything is an art space in Berlin. So I'm here to talk about uh, my project Wendy, which is a comic series I started in 2011. And it's gonna be sort of like a very anecdotal kind of overview of the way I got from there to here and the different kinds of ways that Wendy has like mutated and permutated and transmorgified and uh, has been presented uh, in many different ways, like outside of the comic book that both inform the context that it came from, but also thrive in like completely different contexts. So this uh, is the first com uh, Wendy comic I ever made. Uh, I had no intentions of it going anywhere. Um, 
if you can tell by the subject matter, which is about being hungover or drunk. Uh, it was a one-to-one -one, um, expression of the kinds of experiences I was having at the time because I lived in Montreal in 2011 in St. Henry, which is a neighborhood just below downtown. And I was spending a lot of time sort of just listlessly um, oozing around the neighborhood um, as an artist and a musician. So a lot of the, the early Wendy work is tangentially about being an artist, but I think it's about the identity of being an artist, seemingly like uh, as something that you sort of say without ever feeling like the experience is direct. It feels like there's actually just a lot of time uh, being a messed up person. Um, so here you could see there's an example of the kinds of adventures that Wendy was slash I was participating in, which is a lot of uh, punk lofts and um, making plans of, about like, where to go um, at night. The answer is the punk loft. <laughs> I'll figure this out. Um, a lot of like uh, my first r reasons for making Wendy was to make myself laugh at my own despair or like to, just to sort of relate like very viscerally through these images of, of um, existential horror. Um, I like to think I'm a little more nuanced now. Um, so what happened is um, I had posted a few of these things on Facebook and someone gave me the idea in a Facebook comment that uh, if you buy, if you make uh, an entire comic of this, I would buy it. And I was like, okay, that's good to know. So um, I put together a 60 page comic book called Wendy, which you could see here. And um, I was working a, a job as a layout designer for the newspaper um, on my reservation. Uh, it's called Ganawage. Uh, I'm a Mohawk from Ganawage, just to let you know that as well, because it comes up later. Um, and I remember like after work, and then I had work the next day, and I was uh, sitting on, at my mother's kitchen table, and I, I drew that logo once, and that's been the logo forever, <laughs> because it's fine. <laughs> um, Exposine uh, is a zine fair uh, in Montreal. And um, for the 2011 edition, I printed out that first one. And um, people like were very excited to come and sp um, spend $8 on it, um, which is a little steep, I guess. But anyway, so um, and then what I did is I, I, I set out to make um, another, a sequel, which is Trendy Wendy. And uh, that was another 60 page adventure, 64 pages, I guess. And then um, I, I uh, sold that at Exposine the year after. Um, so let me think about what, how I'm gonna. Okay, so then um, uh, Art Metropole, I, I, uh, Wendy ended up being an Art Metropole basically. Um, I should say that Trendy Wendy, whereas Wendy was more about like tangentially being an artist but being mostly like in a Montreal like music scene, Trendy Wendy tackled a little bit more ideas around moving a little bit further into the future and into your ambitions and into the world as an artist and it dealt more directly with, um, with like the art scene and the politics of like a specific art scene um, more specifically. And so that's why I ended up at our Metropolar. It made sense in relation to being stocked there, for me at least, because it was a parody about the art world and it was in this artist-run center of artist publications. So I guess what I mean to say is that I was parodying the Banff Center uh, in Trendy Wendy, but uh, it's called Flojo Island. So what it really is, it's a parody of the Banff Center and Fogo Island put together. <laughs> Um, <laughs> at which point I um, 
I believe in 2013, decided to put the Wendy, a Wendy book club together at the Banff Center um, because I figured, well, you know, I have a book about this place and uh, <laughs> um, the Banff Center logo looks like a W. So um, that was the first iteration of like discussions around Wendy. This is the poster I made for it. The Wendy Book Club uh, in Glide Hall, room 310, which we called the Soiree Room, which I would describe as looking, well, Brian Youngen described it as it looks like uh, there was a flood and all of the furniture got pushed into the corner and people just left it there. So that's where we had our um, first book club. And here's a very bur blurry photo uh, um, proving that that happened. <laughs> Who's who? Brenda Draney is over there. Uh, here's, uh, yeah, and so, so yeah, like my, generally my experiences in the art world like end up feeding back into the narratives and into the projects. Uh, and again, here is an example of uh, a parody of both the um, super, super modern architecture of Fogo Island mixed with the landscape of the Banff Center. But I suppose it could be Newfoundland as well. No, no, the Rocky Mountains are in the back. That's definitely where we are now. Um, Wendy has been in Canadian art um, as a back page feature, or, or I guess it was, it was on one of the pages of one of the magazines. Um, it, but before it was in Canadian art, it was uh, modern painters um, asked me to do a back page feature um, a few times, maybe like four or five times. The last time I asked them, and then they let me, and then that was it. Um, but um, I, I thought it was like a very interesting place to have Wendy because it was like an art magazine and. Um, I, at one point, I um, included like a very indigenous specific narrative into one of the comics, and I wanted to see, I just wanted to see that in modern painters. Um, there was a Montreal art crawl at one, one point, and uh, the gift for people who were doing the art crawl was this takeaway poster. Possible outcomes on one side, and then creative states of being on the other, and every box is like inspired, um, hungover, uh, excited, bored, just like an emotion and checklist. Uh, Wendy has um, well, okay. After uh, there was a certain point, if not all the time, where I'm asking for advice from everybody all of the time because <laughs> anyway so <laughs> uh i was reading like um new york magazine has an online this like magazine called the cut and they have this the, anyway ad, advice columns are a like popular thing right now online on online magazines and so um it's almost like reading horoscopes for me like i will also read like the weekly online column, advice column. And so the Hairpin is this magazine that doesn't really exist anymore online, and uh, I pitched that I would write my own um, uh, advice column called Ask Wendy. Uh, but the thing was that the question was always art-related, but the answer was a comic that was completely unrelated to the question or anything else. <laughs> very much the way I feel like we might experience how the things that we do are incongruent with the things we actually are thinking about at any moment. Um, Art Metropole in 2014 commissioned me to make this, uh, well, they, they wanted uh, to uh, make some kind of artists multiple. And I was thinking of uh, Wendy as like existing as this weird like uh, commercial object that has kind of like this like teenage fan club kind of aesthetic already. Um, so that it has like a populist appeal, but I called it the Wendy critical reader to kind of give it also some sort of like uh, depth or like academic kind of quality as well. And that manifested by having the book be predominantly comics that I wrote 
well, like casting a bit of like a very like critical eye, like a little more sharply onto like things I was thinking about in the art world. But then I included um, like actual critical text from like writer, like art writers or um, people who write about art, I guess I should say, like into, into it so that you were kind of confronted with this weird hybrid object and uh, the pages were pink. So I should say, uh, tw so like w Wendy also exists as like a, a comic book published by a publisher and it has an ISBN number. Uh, 2014 is the pink one. That was the first, uh, the first like, like published. And like that, that book, like this way of publishing Wendy has a life of its own that's very, very conventional. And I appreciate it because um, I feel like as even if I'm doing all these like weird experiments with like my art practice or whatever, and I feel like I'm failing, or that like things are going nowhere, I know that like at least somewhere like on a shelf at like Indigo, there's like a copy of Wendy, uh, which means I've left like my mark on like higher capitalism. <laughs> and then there's Wendy's Revenge, which came out just last year. Uh, so, so the thing about, okay, so I guess I'm out into this thing of like, Wendy, like it's published, but then like, how do you exhibit it? Like, how does it function as an object or something in an archive or like, how does it exist in space? Uh, and this is one example is you just put it in a vitrine and <laughs> problem solved. <laughs> so that's good for the Kamloops Art Gallery and for me and for people who read it and liked it. Um, I went to LA in 2015 and I stayed there for maybe a month or two, like I really don't remember how long it was, but um, I was asked to be part of an exhibition of like actually like mostly Canadian artists at a commercial gallery uh, called Francois Gabali. And um, I had the intent of just making and fabricating the work there as a direct response to whatever I was experiencing at the time, which is like, uh, like kind of how Wendy operates. And so I made these like uh, kind of like uh, dramatic poems about palm trees and, and about um, going out at night, which were two things I did in LA. I, I saw a palm tree and I went out at night. The thing about palm trees is that a lot of their volume, if not most of their volume, is the dead part of the leaves. And that's not something that you see depicted in popular depictions of palm trees. Thank you, five minutes. So I thought it would be a really funny, dramatic thing for Wendy to respond to. Uh, so I, um, another way that Wendy takes up space is um, this is a billboard in Toronto at Mercer Union uh, from 2015, and she's dyeing her hair black. And it speaks a bit about the transformation of the neighborhood at the time, but also the way that the building is occupied by both people in their private spaces in the bathrooms, but also artists on the ground floor. Um, before Wendy's Revenge came out, I did a um, commission uh, through the Contemporary Art Gallery in Vancouver for the um, vinyl uh, window space that they, they curate every few months or so. And I saw this as almost like a movie trailer um, or like a book trailer for the book coming out. And uh, it was an excerpt from like uh, the book. And uh, the way that the text is oriented, uh, it, it speaks about like uh, moving underground uh, both within yourself, the underground of yourself, but the underground of like uh, your external experience. So um, people who wanted to like actually like read the poem in its entirety would have to read it, walk around, and then go down the stairs and experience the rest of the poem as they were actually going underground. So it was kind of a metaphor for um, moving through space and. And then uh, I made a sign. I went to Japan and I made this like book sign because Wendy was for sale at the bookstore in Japan. So the sign says Wendy for sale. Um, I could talk about this book some other time, I guess. It's like there's a lot to say about it, so I won't say it. <laughs> uh, okay, and then so that's how Wendy exists in space uh, so far, uh, but how it exists as events now, um, besides this talk that you're listening to is um, uh, 
that I do, I've, I do performances. So right here is me and Angela and Hiroki, and we're performing this because it was only um, published in Japanese. And I refused to publish it in English for a long time because I think, like, as much as I appreciate that people like relate to Wendy, like, like I wanted to sort of question people's like feeling like they have some sort of implicit ownership in. So I guess there is something to say about this, like, an implicit ownership in the way that they want to understand the narratives one to one, and uh, that like get, confronting them with like something in Japanese that is completely incomprehensible to them. It's like. It's like, I feel like this is me for me, and like I, I feel like I should understand this, and then I have some ownership over it, but I also feel an extreme alienation from it. And uh, growing up, like uh, learning my indigenous language and then completely forgetting it, and feeling like I'm looking at it through a foggy window from now on, um, and feeling like I, 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 there's something that belongs to me, but I can't access it, like I kind of wanted. Uh, people through experiencing this book like that's entirely in Japanese to understand what that might affectively feel like. So anyway, I caved and then I uh, did a performance of it in English and I projected it up and people got to see the Japanese um, panels and then we like just performed it in English. So, uh, and actually in Mohawk and Japanese, it's like, it's got a little bit of everything. So this is, uh, this is, it was projected really big. She goes on a date with some American guy in Japan. True story. I also uh, included, um, um, I have a character named Winona who's indigenous and uh, there's some chapters in the Japanese book about her life being an artist on the res and having to grapple sort of like, the people in her town not really understanding what she does and then not really being understood by like a contemporary, her contemporaries like outside of the community. And I thought it would be like a very like um, useful thing to, uh, or interesting to have these indigenous, specifically North American indigenous stories like translated directly for a Japanese audience. Uh, I'm running out of time. So I did a reading at a gallery in Chicago um, where people come up and then they read the parts. It's like what I did uh, last night, if you were there. Uh, Chris Krause played one of the characters last night. That was cool. And, uh, and then sometimes I do sci-fi where if like there's things that I want to say that are a little bit more experimental writing or weird, like I do it in a script form. And then I have the sci-fi version of Wendy, whose name is Zendi, and the sci-fi version of Winona, whose name is Zenona. So they become stand-ins for like an other kind of alternate universe from which I can talk like a little more loosely and like, like um, weirdly about concepts that I'm thinking about. And uh, Zenona, for instance, was a like a NFB project that happened recently that encompassed music, sound, and it was a way for me to like like directly uh, tackle the weird like thing of the Canada 150 sort of like here you, now you can tell stories about this like indigenous experience but like we insist we insist that you we insist that you do that in a certain way or like there's a certain expectation of how that would look and uh, somehow they signed off on this thing that like criticizes it thank you That was really fun and amazing, thank you. Um, I'm gonna reverse the order of the questions that I wrote, just because I know Walter might get up and leave, but um, I hope that's okay with everyone, and so I'm gonna ask Walter first, and then Sky, and then Emmanuel, and then David. And then I have some general questions, and I'd love to facilitate questions from the audience, so uh, that's gonna be the fun part, too. So, in Edmonton, we used to play a game where you'd try and match the perfect new technological genre format with its perfect content, like those things kind of meet. So for example, there was one where we decided the perfect rap review and food blog was this blog called Slice of Life. And I joined Twitter to follow a mashup account, which is Kim Kierkegaardashian quotes. It's like a mashup of those two. And you know Emmanuel's work with Instagram 
and your work, Walter, with this kind of genre of the comic blog, kind of seeing how Wendy translates to print, but also to formats like Facebook and, and blogging and kind of this idea of the diary over time and seeing Wendy as an event, but also a space that's growing. So the first time I saw Wendy as an event was in Edmonton at Nuit Blanche Edmonton. Ositsuan Contemporary Art Collective presented an animation of Walter Scott's Wendy on the exterior of the Stanley Milner Library right downtown. And the timing of the animation and the story, um, like there was this hu huge crowd that gathered around and stayed around the work and watched it in its entirety every time. And I was watching the audience, and I, I told Walter about this, but some of them were crying and laughing. And I had, a, I had expected laughter in the streets, but I hadn't expected people to cry. And some of it was just Wendy blinking or like the timing. And I was thinking about how that c could have been represented by the turning of the page, but also just this like knowledge of timing and the framing that you, you know, like it's harder than you think to make a, co a good comic. And it has to do with the timing of the frames, and it has to do with like, you know, the way that each phrase is, is staged, and then the timing and how you took it from a comic to an animation. Again, you know, like there's a lot of like sophistication in that, and so seeing it was pretty amazing. And I was thinking about that kind of story, and I asked you in the lobby, but um, this this is a long question. But anyway, you can talk a little bit about that technique, and then also Wendy being. Um, this character that you describe being influenced by both Kathy Acker and Elle Woods from Legally Blonde, like she's complex. You know, when you have Wendy in your head and you've created such a larger than life figure, like how do you live with her? And does she ever kind of take over or do you argue with her or kind of wish that you could have a bit of time away from Wendy and all these other characters like Screamo and Dee, et cetera? That's a big question. So. <laughs> Um, I think that uh, like a lot of a lot of the success is the fact that Wendy has these like oftentimes like these kind of like these non-gendered experiences but like when I see that the way that we rep like our subjectivities are vastly different in a lot of the ways that we experience like gender-based experiences, that's when I'm actually going to admit now that I'm starting to, because like um, like um, the Hernandez brothers, for instance, like Love and Rockets has this this character uh, who was like this punk, and she she repaired rockets, and it was a bit of a sci-fi comic, but then they decided, and this is what I would like to do, is they decided to have the character age as time went on. So now, like the whole sci-fi element of it is dropped, and it's become like a it's a middle-aged woman, and she's living just a very normal life, and 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 um, so I think that like I'm kind of like scared at like how Wendy is going to have to grow, but she might actually begin to grow out of away from like my experiences. Mm -hmm. So that's the, yeah, like uh, it's kind of become this person that's like starting to get away from me. And I did want to talk about Wendy in relation to this question of afterlife and criticism. So, you know, will you, you know, like this idea that you could maybe let go of Wendy or that she might die or get killed off and what that afterlife might be. And in thinking about that metaphor of the afterlife in criticism to, you know, paracritical context where there's, you know, branches and, and side criticism that follows criticism. And like an example of that for me is like, I don't post very often, but I totally posted this review. It was like a shoe fashion review of Wendy's shoes in relation to like contemporary culture. And it was like this kind of paracritical review of Wendy. And so these things are starting to exist too. And how you think about how Wendy's kind of creating Paracriticism and things like, you know, like it's not completely unrelated, but you know, we have Canadian art cats Instagram accounts and stuff like that, which are not unrelated to this, you know, how to think about art criticism and parody, etc. So what was the question? How you think about afterlife in relation to Wendy and then how that relates to ideas of paracriticism. Mm. 
I think I can, um, I can speak to that by saying that the projects that I've done around Wendy, like I think those will continue. Like the DNA of Wendy will always be inside of them. Whether Wendy continues or not as a comic, I'm not sure. Um, I guess I'm just paraphrasing what you're asking me. But um, I do intend, I think, to continue to make um, writing and performance and sculpture and things like with sort of like the like Wendy ethos of like satire and criticism at its core. But uh, like to, to sort of name exactly what they might look like in the future is a little bit, I can't really do that right now. Yeah, you haven't thought through it. Or like you don't, do you feel the need to control it, I guess, or influence it? Uh, no, because um, the like, and this is very rare for me, but like the, la the lack of control or the like letting go of control has actually generated like these different modes of, of, of making and, and showing. Like um, when I was in LA, um, Georgina Jackson at, uh, in Toronto when she was running Mercy Union was like, oh, maybe you could do some kind of like performance when you come back or like an artist talk. And I was like, or I could do like a, like some kind of weird like show and tell, like fictional show and tell. So that ended up me sort of like writing my experiences of LA and the art that I saw into a, a performance where it's about Wendy experiencing it. And it was kind of like influenced by this weird like critical confession of like Chris Krauss or like Joan Didion's LA kind of, and it turned into this like weird slideshow that was like half fiction, half real. But if I hadn't allowed myself to just do this completely weird thing that I hadn't thought of before. Like I, that, that has led to like other formats. So I guess that's why, that's, that's, that's my excuse for not knowing what to do next. <laughs> a good excuse. But also it should be a secret maybe for Wendy and us. Yes, but it's a huge secret. <laughs> <laughs> secret art criticism. Sky, you're next, and so I was thinking about your work and your presentation. Um, in Friday's kind of workshop with Lisa Robertson, we were looking at a text by Emil Benavista, The Problems of General Linguistics, and this particular excerpt, and we've been talking about it on rhythm, and how the Greek origins of the word and these associations of movement, the words movement, flow, and wave, um, are easily conflated, but etymologically dis discrete. And you know these kinds of, you know, when you're generating content or setting up a system of writing, as you did with the platform of Momus, like how do you moderate or anticipate rhythms of publication and dissemination, and you know these understandings and watching in terms of timing, which you know kind of relates on this idea of like response and um, timing between criticism, reception, counter-criticism, and how that starts to function um, in, in that type of art writing field. Yeah, well, there's a certain um, advantage, obviously, to online publishing, which is uh, that you can move very quickly. And so you can be in conversation, more or less, uh, with, um, let's say it's a controversy or another critic or that sort of thing. Uh, there are other moments when we decide, uh, and it's meaningful to us, and I don't know if the silence is perceived by others or not, but we decide not to jump into the fray, for instance, with Dana Schutz or something like that. So um, that's the, there's some pressure around that. Uh, that I feel as a publisher in the online field. And, and I would also, though, venture that much as that's an available um, spontaneity to us, I, uh, I'm much more interested in pieces that are evergreen, uh, that have a kind of agelessness. Like, I, I think of good criticism as m much like, um, let me start again. I think of good art criticism much like good literary criticism, where you cannot rely on anybody having read the book. And so it's like dropping a stone in water, and you got to see about those circles that emanate out. Um, we should be I, ho hopefully aiming for that kind of effect every time, so that it's less about a show or a particular artist as it is about a bigger um, thread of thinking or a uh, context that's um, perhaps, as I say, a bit more timeless. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that quite answers the question. No, it does, and it, it does kind of relate. Like, I'm 
thinking through threads also of what in Walter's presentation he was talking about things being incong incongruous between thinking and making and responding and just kind of how much time we allow ourselves, how much time we allow others, especially if you're producing content and disseminating com content to others and kind of regulating that or anticipating it and, and if you really felt it was intuitive or you know something that you're responding also to just the fact that there's so much material available to us online mm -hmm. all the time and mm -hmm. and how to also relate to those rhythms and that type of production that's happening incessantly. Right. I mean, to, to sort of quote Triple Canopy's uh, phrase from a few years ago, it definitely is one of our mandates to sort of slow down the internet. And I think that means sometimes not taking the bait and then turning it into clickbait, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of what I was thinking about is, you know, if a lot of these formats and content or in your criticism of the field of art criticism in general in creating moments and the need for it was a demand or a necessity to be brave, you know, what are some of the things that you can tell us or remind us that everyone needs uh, to be reminded of is how do you be more brave in what you consume, what you write? Um, and what you read and what you share with others because each person in their own body is like sharing and also uh, filtering and editing what they share and pass on to their own networks and mm -hmm. communities. That's a tough question. How do we be brave? Um, I mean, obviously do the thing that scares you uh, and be as accountable to it as possible. So uh, fall into a library for a week before you write that thing that scares you. Um, be in conversation with somebody that makes you nervous. Um, but the more interesting part of that question, which I'm not sure I have an answer for, is how do we be brave in what we consume? I think that's a very thoughtful thing um, to ask. And maybe we could open it up to others at this table. Um, because we have so much at our, at our fingertips, I've got 20 tabs open on a given Wednesday. And um, how do we make choices around how we spend the middle part of that day if we're going to fall down a rabbit hole? <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a really thoughtful question, Christy. I appreciate it. But I'm not sure if I can respond right now. Yeah. Does anyone else want to respond to that? No? I mean, you know, in, in the lobby, we were talking about Dylan Robinson's presentation and, you know, that amazing act of writing and asking someone like me, who is of a settler ancestry, to avoid and respect the sovereignty of a chapter that is meant for indigenous readers. And yet, you know, a library and a text to me, it was always about finding the thing you weren't allowed to read and to, you know, get into the library and dig out that text that was like, um, that was gonna shock you or change you or be something that you would never forget. And so, I mean, I, I haven't read it, but I, I don't know if I could promise that I never would, and it kind of makes me feel guilty already, but this is a different thing, and it is part of setting up that system, and it's an important political act, but I do think that um, you know, access and protecting texts or what you make choices in and what you read and share is, is just as important as that act, that um, important act that Dylan did in that text. Um, so maybe, Leading from there, or do you have anything to add to that, anyone? I was just going to say, um, I was echoing something somebody said about the bravery of reading, and I think it's very hard to remain the same you you were entering into a text that was meant for others. Yeah. So you're going to read the thing, <laughs> and then you won't be you again, and that can be difficult. So mm. That's true. Thanks. So on that note, I was going to ask Emmanuel a question, but I wanted to read, and it's kind of weird to read to the author, I guess, but um, in this book here, which is the... Don't do that, don't do that. Don't do it? I really want to, I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, the Sound of Things to Come, in the chapter titled The Museum of Silver Lights on page 174, it says, I often dreamed of an empty room with light bulbs covering the ceiling, and in my dreams I watched the lit room from a distance, usually unable to go in, Sometimes this dream happened when I was awake. I knew then that it was fixed in my memory. I knew my dreams by heart. I had come to the point when I was the one who determined what I dreamed about, what I made believe, and in this capacity, this ability to stretch myself to such lengths did not come by chance. 
And so it's true, I would rather listen to you read any day of the week, but um, <laughs> your presentation is entitled The Promise of Mutability, which indicates a prophecy of change, which is necessary, and we've talked about things that are necessary, but necessary can be a duty. Um, and this word has been mentioned, and I think that maybe it also could mean then imperative. So um, of a change that's wanted, that's wanting, and anticipated, which means that it's inevitable, the change is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So in thinking about digital formats and also access for writers, and in this shuffling effect that you talk about, um, shifting the way that we approach archives and that this is an anticipated, inevitable, and necessary uh, imperative shuffle. Um, you know, your, th your thoughts on the stretching of access and capacity in space. Mm. Well, I mean, I, I came to a point last year, which is, which is rather, I guess, strange for me, um, when I had written this essay, um, and by the time I got to the end of writing the essay, I felt that the task of decolonization wasn't quite done. Um, and um, I had to, I admit that that wasn't something I grew up thinking. I mean, I certainly knew that my, my curriculum, I come from Nigeria, by the way, if I didn't mention that, um, my curriculum had been colonized in a certain way. Um, you had to, I was punished, for instance, I remember clearly that I was punished for um, speaking vernacular, right? Um, you know, this idea that you had to ascribe to a certain form of um, <laughs> civilization. And this is already, this is in the 80s, um, you know, early 90s kind of situation. So it's not um, in the 60s when Nigeria was newly independent. And so to come to that moment where after years of um, working as a writer, I still felt that the task of decolonization wasn't quite done was very revelatory for me. And that led me to begin to look at you know, this archive um, and to think about how I could respond in a way that um, almost like counteracted um, on a fundamental level what the impulses of um, that archive was, you know, was, right? Which was to portray a certain kind of um, nativism and a certain kind of, um, um, this is what the order looks like. Um, so, but more to your question, um, it was, I just felt that I couldn't write criticism that addressed it in a headlong manner, you know? I mean, there's, there's you know, um, several writers and several scholars who have written about the archive in, in a very compelling manner. Um, and I wanted to bring my own sort of um, slant, you know, I wanted to slant myself in a different way, um, I guess, against the archive and to think through narrative particularly. Um, because I knew that there was a certain way in which I had experienced, I had traveled, for instance, through Nigeria and through, and I don't mean travel as in the fiscal trip, but like in my own sort of um, sensibility, you know, how I traveled through Nigeria, I traveled through the continent. Um, and not necessarily that they were, those ways of travel were, were peculiar, but they could reveal something about my relationship to other people. Um, so it was a question of how do I think very clearly about the lives of others, right? Um, um, so I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but I, I feel that um, in a sense, my all of the work that I've been doing, um, you know, through like online forums, you know, um, starting a magazine, you know, you know, starting another magazine that was defunct after a year. Um, um, writing anything, you know, um, in response to photography is really an attempt to walk through um, narrative as a like as an as, as sort of a form of criticism, right? Um, and um, because I, I I believe, you know, as I said, I think in my um, in the opening that you know every concept has to be transformed into feeling. Um, and uh, more and more I have faith that it's only stories that can do that, you know? Um, and um, how do you make space within stories to accommodate all of the um, sort of um, high concepts of, um, of research and scholarship that, um, uh, that is kind of recognizable to, 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 to a dendrologist, you know, to someone who thinks squarely through the language of tree making and tree planting, rather, or someone who, tree, a mathematician who thinks through the language of um, symbols. How do you um, think through Agamben, for instance, and, and offer that sort of thinking to um, a mathematician? 
um, and um, final uh, final thing to say, you know, because I can keep going, um, is that um, I, I think that I mean when I when I started writing about art, it was specifically in response to an experience of traveling with photographers, and um, I had just come out of law school. <laughs> Um, I'd had this education where I was taught to think in a certain way, which I still fall back on, you know, in, in terms of the rigor. And that's why I'm still dread, always wearing jackets, um, because <laughs> you, had to, you had to dress in a certain way. Um, and that form of education, that form of thinking never leaves you. And, but I entered into writing about art, um, particularly because I was unsure that um, writing only fiction would kind of accommodate my interests. Um, accommodates um, in a sense the, you know, both the the rigor of um, of tr of trying to know, you know, um, as well as the the attempt to tell stories, right? So fiction wouldn't necessarily only allow for that. And after a few years of writing about art, it seems more that um, I I should reach, you know, there's this idea of reaching across the aisle, right, in political speak but how can I bridge the genre divide? Um, um, and that has become even, you know, in a sense, forceful in my, in my way of approaching my thinking. I'm kind of all over the place, right? But that's... No, no, that's great. <laughs> um, in thinking about audience, which I think has a lot to do with how people define their own distribution um, of their work, or in even setting up in how you think about what publication method to choose, or in choosing a new publication method, mm. um, how broad is your ideal reader base? Essentially, you know, like some of the writers in this audience have talked about how they're really writing for like just a, maybe a few people, mm. and that other people are, are writing to make a shift to a very large group of in, in, individuals, and like, in your mind, because any other reader is essentially then inconsequential, not unimportant, but it you know, may or may not be for them. Yeah. You know, how broad or specific is your reader group? It, that's, uh, <laughs> I mean, I struggle with that question all the time. Um, and the first thing to say is that I come from sort of like a literary tradition that um, you know, the work that is really celebrated is the work that is considered um, simple, right? Um, so you have um, Chino Achebe who wrote Things Fall Apart, and he's sort of like a model for, <laughs> you know, people because, oh, he's so simple in his use of language and direct, but also very wise and profound. Um, and there's almost like, um, um, as a result of his, you know, important legacy, you know, there's like a, a slew of writers who are thinking in terms of like, how can the writing be simple, you know, simple as they say in Nigeria, as ABC. Um, and um, I was always suspicious of that. Um, I was always suspicious of the idea that one had to write um, in a way that was simple, almost like you are, um, you are, you are thinking that, in, that the reader cannot be intelligent enough. Mm -hmm. um, but then on the other hand, like a lot of my, my, my thinking revolves around the idea of clarity. Um, um, and um, for me, clarity is in, on, on, you know, there are two things, you know, how do you approach um, complicated ideas with, um, with a sense of urgency to, to pull out the essential of that, that, um, that idea, you know? So if I'm, if I'm thinking about desire, um, which is such a complicated term. How do I think through the long, you know, as I, you know, read, you know, think through trees and begin to figure out like there's something really clear about desire when looking at trees, um, you know, um, or my recent obsession of Venn diagrams, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is, you know, that's, you know, when I'm bored, I kind of draw Venn diagrams now. And, um, and the idea of like, how do you think about the, um, the, you know, the idea that lives enter into ours, you know, those shaded areas and Venn diagrams. So when you're approaching, um, when I'm approaching the reader, when I'm approaching the audience, the first thing I think about is the moment of encounter, right? The moment mm -hmm. where someone stumbles on this writing, someone that is, you know, curious, you know, whoever that is. Um, and I'm very wary of thinking in terms of um, the scale of that, you know, of that readership. I am more interested in um, the accidents that might occur, you know, if this writing 
when I've done my, my work to ensure that it's clear enough and that it's um, rigorous enough um, and it contains um, um, some feeling and capacity to, to, to contain feeling, um, how it can reach um, a stranger. Um, and I don't, I don't say that with any sort of like understanding of how that might work. These are just metaphors. Um, um, and finally, I think that the act of writing is really an act of projection, right? Like, so you're always like, you know, pitching forward, um, so to speak. You're always like assuming that <laughs> there's the possibility. There's, there's almost like, you know, this idea that um, hope, um, hope is a contraband, you know? Like, you know, it's almost like an impossible act in itself to even assume that there will be an audience for your work. <laughs> um, and I, th I don't take that light. I just like, you know, let's keep assuming. Um, <laughs> we, we, what is the promise, you know, of this assumption? Um, but after I've done my work, and I think everyone would agree with that, it's like you can't, you can't fuss over um, who reads you and what the scale of that reader, especially for when you're from Nigeria, <laughs> um, that has, you know, like 170 million people. They're just like, I place my hope um, in the hands of God or something. Yeah. Amazing, thank you. Um, thinking about the last slide that you showed, Thanks, Walter. Can we just say thank you? Um, there's a neighborhood in Edmonton named after David's ancestors, the Garneau family. Uh, Eleanor and Laurent Garneau settled um, in Edmonton after Laurent fought with the uh, Real in the rebellion, and they owned River Lot 7. Uh, River Lot 7 is right down by the North Saskatchewan River in the middle of the city. Um, and it was marked on the first urban plan, that, that lot. And there's a tree there named the Garneau tree that Laurent planted in 1874. And it's a Manitoba maple. And they believe that Eleanor brought it with her to Edmonton from Manitoba. And it's really old and it's on the U of A property now and they decided that it needed to be cut down. And this morning they cut it down. Um, yesterday there was a big gathering at Edmonton of more than 100 people got together to say goodbye to the Garneau tree. And so I was thinking about how could I not talk about the Garneau tree when talking to you today. And at the same time, you know, wondering that there are formal ways that words um, can create risk for lives and that we sometimes take for granted being in Calgary or being in Canada in this time and place, that that isn't the case. But, you know, Eleanor saved the life of her, of her partner by erasing words on paper and washing them in a wash basin during that time period, during the rebellion, and therefore was able to create a generation that led us and gave us the talk today from David. So in thinking about generations and being awareness, you know, in that Mohawk tradition of three generations behind you, but also three generations in front of you, um, when you write and when you speak, and I know you're aware of, you know, the Garneau ancestry, you know, how you contextualize that and also the implications for future indigenous critics um, and writers. Jeez. <laughs> so sorry. First of all, you bring me through an emotional roller coaster and recalling the tree and the ceremony yesterday and then It's uh, a beautiful tree. It has four trunks, this gravity, but yeah, gravity does a, does not win. It's not the kind of tree you would draw as a kid of just going straight up. It's two branches, the other two have been destroyed and it's big and it's gnarly and it's all cut up and and uh, rotten, it, it's rotten, um, and three, lives three times longer than it should. Um, so growing it up in Edmonton, um, knowing that a word was attached to a neighborhood and attached to a tree and other things, Garneau, and that I had that word attached to me, um, made me uh, consequential in that space um, later, later on. Mostly I thought that was a, a, a family business. It wasn't until I was 18 that it got linked to that word Métis and so on. Um, but the story of Eleanor is really great. You know, like Laurent was going to be uh, arrested by the RCMP for his participation in the Real Resistance of 1885. And 
So when the cops came to the house, she had the presence of mind to grab a letter purportedly from Louis Riel. She was doing the laundry and, and washed it away. And I've been obsessed by that uh, erasure, and I've done a number of drawings trying to replicate the text, and then erase, and there's, at a certain point, you're erasing the, the surface stuff, but some other stuff gets pounded into the paper, and there's some resonance, you know, um, while Indigenous people intermarry and become whiter and whiter, um, there's still something else that gets pounded in deeper and deeper. Um, I don't know how that relates well to your critical question. I did want to say that uh, I'm really interested in online writing because of that permanent presence of the past, how all these texts circulate and create these new different beings. And I'm also interested in how um, this sort of provisional online criticism happens among Indigenous people in, by email and so on. And I know you didn't write to the debate for Amanda PL and uh, uh, for the Dana Schultz, but I love in that venue I was able to respond in quick quips and then attach articles where I had slowed things down and you know from 10 years before I could post things. And because people were genuinely interested and I think in terms of some kind of critical leadership we do have to provide judgment at that time. Um, I don't know if that. It does. Um, I work with a group of Sitsi One, and we would talk a lot about um, editing as mediating um, between a writer and a reader, and what that means, and what that power is, and um, the need for more Indigenous editors, the need for access between Indigenous writers, authors, and um, uh, distributors of publications, printers, art book presses, et cetera, and direct relationships, as was advised by Amy uh, through Ruth, who also shared that advice to me years ago, um, to create direct relationships with the people who, who print and distribute your work and your ideas. And that to not have that is just another um, complication in this system of um, colonization that is still continuing, even though there are all these efforts and work that's happening to decolonize these structures. But, um, you know, in, in our Osizu one conversation, we've talked about um, how some of the best conversations in Indigenous art criticism happen on Facebook threads. Um, but there are important things happening, Jolene Rickard is leading, uh, launching an indigenous art journal, written and publishing work by indigenous authors globally. But um, are there any other things that you see that you want to happen or things that others could hear and maybe make happen in their own communities? Well, I'm not really interested in decolonization. It's so boring and tiring, it's exhausting. And debatably impossible. So I'm interested in non-colonial activities of any sort. So that's reaching back to prior um, practices before contact and, and gatherings talking, that's, that's the main one. But I'm only also interested in the industry that does require the unconsciousness of indigenous folks. And so I'm most interested when indigenous folks are coming to consciousness among themselves and helping each other up. Um, and interested in how critical thinking uh, requires that because writing is consciousness. And um, so encouraging youth to write in any form is encouraging consciousness, self-reflection, and a creation of identities. And I'm interested in those folks understanding themselves within the indigenous rather than just their local community. And just as you know, not all women are instantly feminist, not all indigenous people know who they are. Um, or you know who you are at different levels. And the indigenous is a new being. It's only 20, 25 years old. And we're constantly understanding ourselves. So being able to communicate with people who are indigenous in other spaces in Australia and New Zealand, Sami people, uh, really helps change that and construct this new being. Thank you. That's amazing. Um, I'd like to facilitate a few questions for the audience. Uh, if you have a question, there'll be a microphone that'll pass around. And if you could either address the person to whom you'd like to ask a question, or you can ask the panel at large and we can have a few questions. It's hard to see up here. There's one way at the back. 
that Ashley? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for your generous thoughts. Um, I was just wondering if the panel at large, whoever wants to address or talk to this question, could speak about um, how you deal with the dilemma of erasure when we're inundated with so much information. There's obviously a lack for specific types and qualities, uh, canons of information and writing and criticism. So either you can answer it personally or broadly, but I'm just wondering, uh, and, and specifically framing this question in the, in the context of archiving your work. Does that make sense? If you yes, thanks. Um, OK, so um, I think the second part um, of the question is what I'm interested in. Um, I, I have a lot of, um, I have a tendency to be very um, despairing about about the future um, and I'm sure that's shared with everyone <laughs> sure everyone has that tendency you're just like there's nothing good that is going to come out of this world um, and so my my relationship to my work um, in terms of that despair is to just keep walking um, and to and so this 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 restlessness of not knowing what the work would then you know culminate into produces a certain kind of relentlessness you know um, and um, I don't, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't necessarily think about that in terms of erasure, um, because there are all kinds of ways in which, you know, for instance, my own history has already been erased. So, um, in a sense, you walk from. There's a sense in which you're walking from um, something that never really existed. It's almost like how do you, how do you walk when the language of the future was denied from you? You know, like you, it was kind of already taken away. So there is really just this stuporous movement between the cracks um, of, of past and, and present. Um, and so I've sort of put my faith in um, um, relentlessness um, in the sense that you keep walking on a, just like the sea, you know, the, the idea of the sea, you know, you just keep walking on this, um, on this level of one wave leading to, that, to another. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm interested in the role of the curator as um, one who cares, takes cares of care of things, and is a source of, if they have authority, it's accumulated by good judgment and good writing, and editors operate in the same way. So on Facebook, or um, especially when someone that uh, writes with care uh, directs me towards something like, um, Anything that Elwood Jimmy tells me to do or read, I'll do that, or <laughs> Wanda Nana Bush, or there's a whole list of people that um, uh, probably don't know that I hold them in such esteem. Um, and I wrote a list down here so I wouldn't forget Ursula Johnson, Christy Belcourt, Tanya and Dwayne Linkletter, and onwards. Um, so there are people that, I, that have a, a network of care that direct me to things that I ought to be knowing that I don't already know. So um, I think the need for editors and curators is profound in this time of so much noise. Yeah, I would really agree with that. I, I mean, I was tempted to sort of um, say that I either misunderstood or just don't agree with the premise of the first part of the question. But I, it's probably the former that I just don't understand. I would say there's so much. There's such a volume that that can itself feel like a vacancy, right? We can be so intimidated to drop in because how do you start? And so if I'm making any contribution to that noise, which on certain days I regret doing, um, it's that uh, I'm doing it with great care. And so there's a kind of accountability, at least that I'm straining for um, on my best day to, um, to make sure that one, there's a generosity in the language so that you could be coming to it, um, whatever that it is, um, without prior knowledge. Ideally, you'd be curious and very, fairly literary in your sensibilities, but otherwise, I don't need you to know. Ideally, that writer is going to, and we as the editors, are going to do our work um, to be generous to you. And that's what I mean by accessibility as part of our mandate, um, so that you don't have to read every article in existence on any given piece of arcana. <laughs> Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. <laughs> 
If there's anyone brave. <laughs> There's a hand over here. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Hello and thank you. Um, I do have a question, David. The last thing that you said in your talk was, um, and I didn't get all the words written down fast enough, so if you wouldn't mind repeating it and then uh, um, adding to it possibly if you're willing. Um, you said what we need is non-colonial modes of blank and critical care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's your very last statement. So indigenous contemporary art and artists are not best served by settler style adversarial, shame-based modernist criticism, even if written by native critics. What we now need is uh, need to develop is non-colonial modes of critical care. Oh, and I added the blank was extra rational. <laughs> and uh, I wrote a piece uh, for, uh, I can't remember which magazine, Border Crossings maybe, or Fuse, where it's sort of expanding on that extra rational aspect. And I mean, I always end my paragraphs with things that imply another paragraph but really lead to another essay. <laughs> so um, I will do a keynote in Banff in a few weeks, and that will be one of the main subjects. And so I don't mean to be romantic there, because intuition, I'm a, you know, a closet Jungian, rather Freudian, and uh, I do like the idea of accessing, I like the possibility of accessing something from some other realm. I, got, I always got to leave that door open, right? And, uh, and certainly with indigenous um, thinking, that's, that's key. At the same time, most of the things we call intuitive is simply recall and prejudice. And so it requires a criticality rather than expression. So most of my work is not expressive work, expression work. Um, that's, I, I just work in a different critical mode of truly wanting to understand the project of another and communicate it back to that person. So um, sometimes though, then I'll keep, make these leaps of extra rational judgment. Uh, it starts with a perception but ends in a judgment to throw that out to see if it comes back and if it was resonant. Uh, that doesn't always make it true, but you know, resonance is good enough in this area. I hope that makes sense. But by non-colonial, I'm referring to um, not a reaction against Western thinking because there's no such thing as Western thinking. Thinking is thinking all over the place. And there are certain traditions, though, that have been apprehended by colonization for its, its instrumental value of being able to get people away from the land or to humiliate them into despair and suicide. Uh, so I'm a little interested in strategies that do the opposite of that part, so that's reactive. But I'm also interested in throwing out terms like non-colonial so people wrestle with them and come up with solutions that are better than mine. Does any other panelist want to add something to that idea of resonance? Or? No. Okay. No, that's perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists for the intellectual and critical space you've each created and the opportunities that you've each created in your wake and all of the future opportunities that you've given to other writers and readers now and in the future. And thank you. I think it's time for the wrap up. Thank you so much, Christy, um, David, Sky, Emmanuel, and Walter.